It is my privilege to introduce to you today MJ Mike O'Brien, author of We Shall Not Be Moved, the Jackson Woolworth sit-in, and the movement it expired, published by the University Press of Mississippi. Mike's book centers on a single image, an iconic photograph taken on May 28, 1963 by Fred Blackwell, depicting a biracial group of students being taunted and harassed as they sit peacefully and stoically at a segregated lunch counter. MJ O'Brien sets the stage for us, writing that all of the players are in place. Freddie Blackwell is standing, straddling the lunch counter and the service counter, determined to get the perfect photograph to show us his Jackson News audience exactly what they are missing. He points his camera, checks his flash, flames the action, and shoots. What we see in the result is a barrage of stories, individual stories, group stories, woven together to make a unique tapestry about race and resolve in a southern town. Mike has done a remarkable job in capturing and conveying that barrage of stories and helping us to better understand the people who were involved in the Jackson, Mississippi movement. He has gone even farther. In reviewing his book, Lillian Smith Book Award author Francoise Hamlin writes that by contrasting the ugliness and human weaknesses on both sides with the bravery and fortitude of a few, O'Brien has crafted a beautifully written text that transcends the local story. Chris Myers Ash writes that scholars and lay readers alike will find much to learn and enjoy in this book. O'Brien's labor of love has produced a fascinating account of this important civil rights history. Congratulations, Mike, on this, your first book and labor of love, which we understand was 20 years in the making. It is my privilege to present you this 2014 William Smith Book Award. Thank you, Charles, for those uh, kind remarks, and uh, it's uh, wonderful to, uh, to be here. Um, when the University Press of Mississippi's publicist uh, told me in an email that, I, that We Shall Not Be Moved had been selected for this award, I immediately wrote back and said, I'm honored, humbled, and speechless for once. <laughs> and that pretty much still sums it up. To think that this book, so long in the making, as Charles said, 20 years, so heartfelt in its intent uh, to tell the complete story of the Jackson Woolworth sit-in of 1963, and all of the singular, that this singular protest unleashed on uh, the state of Mississippi for both good and for ill. Uh, to think that this incredible story and my telling of it would come to the attention of the Lillian Smith jury and that they would deem it worthy to carry this stamp of approval that the award confers. It's just something that I could never have imagined during the many difficult years of yearning for this manuscript to get into the hands of someone who would understand its power and its potential. So I want to thank everyone associated uh, with uh, the award, and most especially um, Lillian Smith herself. As you heard, um, you know, Ms. Smith, uh, we are indebted to her uh, for her courageous efforts to create a better society for her beloved Southland. And her writings of the 30s, 40s, and 50s provided really the intellectual framework um, for white Southerners of conscience to begin to challenge the evils of segregation. So we are really all in her debt. And I was so lucky 37 years ago uh, this summer to come upon my own version of Lillian Smith uh, in the person of Joan Trumpower Mulholland, uh, a slight white southern woman who has Georgia roots. Her mother was from Oconee, Georgia, um, but she had been on the front lines of the student civil rights movement from its very beginning um, in, in the sit-ins in Greensboro. 
uh, moved those same demonstrations then to her home region of Northern Virginia and Washington, D.C., participated in the Freedom Rides a year later, was locked up in Parchman Penitentiary in Mississippi, ended up integrating the historically black college of Tougaloo College in, right outside of Jackson, and somehow two years later ended up at the center of this demonstration. Uh, that, that uh, Charles described, and which is, in fact, the focal point of We Shall Not Be Moved. When I met Joan in 1977, her radical student movement days were far behind her, and she was a beleaguered uh, single mother of five boys, ranging in ages from nine to five. Now, you do the math. <laughs> the last two were twins. Um, but you would never have suspected that 15 years earlier, uh, that she was at the forefront of the revolution for uh, racial equality in this country. And honestly, she never spoke about her activist days. It was all that she could do to get the kids off to school or off to summer camp, which is where I met them and, and eventually met her, uh, and have a few hours of peace before they came rumbling back into her life. Um, so it was really left to the kids to tell me about her radical past. And they would say to me, my mom's in a famous picture. And sometimes they would pull out the scrapbooks and actually prove it to me. And uh, that's how I came to understand uh, Joan's role in the Woolworth sit-in. But I really didn't understand the impact of that pi picture um, until 15 years later, 1992, I'm actually here in Georgia on a business trip, um, staying right at the Marriott Hotel downtown Atlanta. And I decided to make my way over to the Martin Luther King Center uh, you know, of nonviolent social change right down Auburn Avenue. And after going through the many major exhibits in, in that esteemed location, uh, most of which focus on uh, King's uh, triumphal achievements, uh, I was about to leave and go back to the hotel, go back to work, and I saw a little sign that said photographs. And it was pointing to a little room off to the side. And I said, well, I want to catch everything here before I go back, so, I, so I'm just going to make a quick little sweep around the room. And that quick little sweep ended up turning into 20 years. <laughs> because what I saw in that room was that picture that the kids had been telling me about, that little picture that their mom was in, was there uh, amongst all the many other you know, iconic moments of the civil rights movement. And for that photograph to be in that most holy of places for the civil rights uh, shrines, it just shocked me. I actually out loud said, oh my god, I know that woman. Yeah, in the center of the photograph. And uh, I realized this is an important picture. It's not just you know, a scrapbook memento. Um, and so I began to wonder how this photograph really fit in to the overarching you know, timeline of the civil rights movement. And I figured if I didn't know that story, and I knew the woman at the center of the photo, most people probably didn't know it either. So this is a story that needs to be told. So from that moment, I determined it was my role to try to tell that as best I could. Not only uh, so that I could figure out what that moment meant for the city of Jackson, for the state of Mississippi, and for the civil rights movement as a whole. So that's what I did with We Shall Not Be Moved. I tried to tell the complete holistic picture of that day um, and, and in retrospect, the entire story of the Jackson movement that it, in fact, did inspire, while using Fred Blackwell's iconic image as a, center, a centerpiece. I started interviewing every single person who was part of that demonstration, and there were nine of them who sat in that day, and anyone else I could find who had a part in, uh, in, try, in making the demonstration a reality. Um, I then branched out to talk to any cameramen or news photographers who might have still been around. Um, I actually talked to one of the undercover cops who was in the, in the Woolworths that day, and he ended up later becoming uh, the chief of police of the city of Jackson, but he was still around. I uh, wrote away uh, under the Freedom of Information Act and got uh, a copy of all the FBI records because there were many FBI people there in the room that day. They weren't taking any action you can tell them all because they have their sunglasses on, right? They're, they're trying to be incognito. And, uh, and they're watching everything that's going on, but they're not doing anything to stop the assault that's happening against the, the, the demonstrators. And I even, by scouring through the local high school yearbooks, was able to find one of the guys who was you know, 
in the crowd who was uh, doing all the evil things to the demonstrators. And I, I try to tell his story too. So it was a fascinating project, uh, made even more so by the attempt uh, uh, to find out what really drove those demonstrators to that point in their lives that they were willing to put their lives on the line. And that's exactly what they did. They risked their lives uh, for the cause of racial equality. <coughs> And, and conversely, I wanted to find out what made those young rebels feel that this demonstration was such a threat to their way of life that they, had to, they, had to, they felt that they had to do whatever they could to try to stop it. Um, and although I have a point of view about all that, uh, I tried to give each of those characters uh, the opportunity to speak in their own words and, and to have their, uh, have their say, to have their do. Um, so it was not well known at the uh, time that I started this project 20 years ago, and I honestly don't think it's that well known now, that this demonstration set off a two-week groundswell of protests throughout the city of Jackson that, uh, that culminated tragically uh, with the assassination of Medgar Evers, uh, the NAACP state coordinator and leader of the Jackson movement. And We Shall Not Be Moved documents that entire period up to inc and including the Evers funeral uh, where a last-ditch effort was made to revive a faltering movement and, and where Mississippi showed the world what a police state it had become. And, uh, you know, today we've seen echoes of that same type of police crackdown over racial matters just in the past few weeks. Uh, and it's horrifying to me to realize that we have, uh, we keep unlearning the lessons of our own history. Uh, and we just, we can't continue this way. We've got to We've got to change. Well, the book ends by uh, filling out the life stories of all the players on both sides that I was able to contact. Uh, and it tells their stories after the spotlight of history uh, had moved on. And uh, their stories are both uplifting, uh, but also sad, inspiring, but, but also somewhat uh, tinged with tragedy, just as, in fact, the Jackson movement was. And, you know, to my point of view, life tends to be as well. Um, the story that I tend to, that I ended the book with is the story of the photographer. Um, I mentioned him earlier. Fred Blackwell was a 22-year-old rookie photographer at the Jackson Daily News when he took his most famous picture. Um, and on the morning of May 28, 1963, he was told to go to Woolworths and cover what was expected to be a very pro forma demonstration. Instant arrest was expected. And so he thought he'd only have a few seconds to take a few shots so that he could get them into the afternoon paper. But when the police refused to enter the store and allowed a mob uh, to develop, Blackwell found himself as one of the few still photographers amongst a gathering uh, throng of hostile teenagers and uh, local adult whites. And what's interesting about this story is that Blackwell himself was a local. He had grown up just down the street from some of the kids who were dumping the ketchup and the mustard and hurling the insults at the demonstrators. He had gone to the same school with their older brothers and sisters. He was one of them. And like them, he entered Woolworths that morning as a segregationist. But what he witnessed that day would change his life because he watched the members of his own class and culture turn into the hateful pawns of the unjust system of segregation with their taunts and assaults on peaceful and nonviolent citizens. And he began to question the very underpinnings of the society that had nurtured him. And he left that scene profoundly shaken. He, uh, as a result of what he witnessed that day, Blackwell began to realize that segregation was unsustainable. Uh, he had seen its evil underbelly and he had endured the three hours of uh, assaults along with the demonstrators and the chaos and the cruelty of the crowd. So he became a believer of racial integration. Something shifted in his heart that day, and he has never wavered. So for me, Fred Blackwell became a symbol of hope for the New South, which, uh, as we know, continues to evolve with a script that continues to be written. I want to quickly thank the Southern Regional Council, that formidable organization that has uh, supported progressive social change now for nearly a century. 
along with the University of Georgia Libraries and the Georgia Center for the Book for sponsoring this award. I want to thank our esteemed panel of, of uh, judges uh, for their recognition of We Shall Not Be Moved as a story that would, I hope, even make Miss Lillian proud. Um, I also want to thank the University Press of Mississippi for taking a chance on this untried uh, emerging author. This is the first time that one of their books has ever um, been awarded this prize. And it tells you something, I think, about uh, that, how far that state is coming in, in acknowledging its past and seeking a degree of racial reconciliation. I must thank my wife, Allison McGill, who's here today uh, with me, uh, who has been with me throughout this entire 20-year uh, odyssey and who's been a constant source of encouragement. I have a couple of other people also to thank who have local ties to Georgia. Uh, Lynn Whitaker was my first editor. Lynn is here also, and the first person to make me believe, come on, you can, you can say hi, ladies. <laughs> uh, to make me believe that writing this story and getting it published was within the realm of possibility. And Lynn is, uh, as I said, a native of Georgia. She's now a graduate student at the University of Georgia, um, getting her PhD in English literature. And, um, Another person with local ties to my head, oh, a great debt of gratitude to is, is Julian Bond. And Julian wrote the foreword, beautiful foreword for the book, uh, and was an early champion of my work. So it's great to be able to accept this award in what used to be his home turf. Um, I'd like to dedicate this award, as I dedicated the book, to Joan Trumpower Mulholland, to Medgar Evers and his family, and, and to all those who participated in the Jackson movement. It was their witness their courage, their sacrifice that helped change our world. And in closing, let me just quickly return to uh, Fred Blackwell and that incredibly evocative photograph. Uh, Fred never received the kind of recognition that I believe he deserved while working on what was called the race beat. He never won a Pulitzer Prize or a News Photographer's Award because in those days it was the publisher, not the photographer, who submitted entries uh, for these types of awards. And there was no Southern segregationist newspaper that was going to think that that photograph had any merit whatsoever. <coughs> but no matter, Fred just went ahead and did his job and created, as I say in the book, an image that captured the essence of an era. And because his photograph inspired me to write this story and kept me going even during the darkest days when I didn't think it would ever see the light of day, I'd like to share this award with Fred Blackwell, who's still alive and living in Jackson, and to thank him publicly for his exceptional service to his profession and to our country. Thank you all so very much for this great honor.